Church, how you doing this morning? Oh, how you guys doing this morning? You guys still tired from Fourth of July? I know I had a pretty late night. Um, I had my first experience up in Hungry Horse at this place called the War Zone. Um, if you value safety, I I don't know if I would encourage you to go, but uh, but I had a blast. So if you go ahead and stand up with me, we're gonna go ahead and worship. Lord Jesus, we just dedicate this time to you. God, we recognize that you're the Lord of all. You're our Savior. So Jesus, right now we just look to you. We just call upon your name. That you would come and you'd meet us here. We stand here with our arms open wide. We're here to sing you some songs, Lord God. But ultimately we pray that you just be glorified. Through everything we do, that you would be lifted high. Love you. There is no life without you. You have all that we need. Where you are, every fear is broken. And the darkness must flee.
nothing good in me. You are love, you are love on display for all to see. You are light, you are light when the darkest closes in. You are hope, you are hope, you have covered all my will sing no other name Jesus Jesus my heart will sing no other name Jesus Jesus my heart will sing no other name Jesus, 
Jealous for me, if love's like a hurricane, I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions, eclipsed by glory, and I realize just
you are hope. You give us courage. You make us brave. Jesus, I pray that you would give us faith to do the things that are impossible in the world, God. God, it's through your son, Jesus, that we have everlasting life, and that's unheard of. You do the impossible. You do the incredible. God, you take, you take us, our, our broken vessels. You take us and you use us to do incredible things. So God, I pray that you would give us faith to listen to you, to follow you, to be obedient right away, all the way, with a happy heart. God, we love you. We seek after you. I may be weak, your spirit is strong in me. My flesh may fail, my God, you never will. I may be your spirit is strong in me, my flesh may fail, my God, you never will. I may be weak, but your spirit is strong in me, my flesh may fail, my God, you never will. I may be weak, but your spirit is strong in me. Baby. 
trust when you say that you're good. But it doesn't matter because you're the only thing that matters. You're the only thing that matters to us, Jesus. So God, we thank you for the cross. We thank you for your sacrifice. God, we just want to exalt you and lift you high this morning. That's our sole purpose this morning, is to look to you and lift you high and declare that you are Lord. Jesus, we love you so much. We offer all these things in your name. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right, church, go ahead and turn around and shake the hand you have. on this holiday weekend. Well, it's been a fun weekend. Got to see some fireworks shot off, some th fireworks blow up close to me, but uh, I'm, I'm alive and ready to worship Jesus today. So it's a fun day. Well, in your, when you came in this morning, you received a program. If you take a moment and grab that program, grab that connection card. Um, first, second time guests, it's a great way for us to get to know you a little bit better. Uh, we all take an opportunity this moment to fill us out with as much information as we feel comfortable filling out. And hang on to that card because at the end of the message today, we'll have the chance to respond to the message on the back of that card. A lot of stuff happening around here at Cal CC um, throughout the summer and coming up here in the fall. And if you want to be aware of what's happening, opportunities for you to be plugged in at, uh, make sure you go to our website, calcc.org, and check out upcoming events. You can go out into this hall, hall, our hallway right here and check out the hub. Um, you can check out your program. One thing I want to make you aware of, um, tomorrow evening, Monday night, 7 o'clock, we are having a members-only meeting. So if you're a member, this is a great opportunity for you to get to know, uh, get plugged in, 
for this opportunity. We're going to be voting on our remodel here in the church. So we want to make sure you're there to, to voice your vote. Um, and we're actually going to be having a kids' ice cream party. So uh, make sure you bring your kids. So this is a great opportunity to get your kids in here. They're going to have a blast eating some ice cream. And then we're going to have bl a blast right in here um, seeing what God's going to do for in our future here at, at Christian Center. Uh, we're g continuing on our series called What's Next. Pastor Phil Wilson is going to be sharing the message with us. And the title of today's message is Pick Up the Cloak. morning. It's great to be with you today. We're going to dive into God's Word. We're going to be in 1 Kings 19. So if you have a Bible, if you have a phone, go ahead and get there. We're going to land there for a little bit today. Talking about how to live out God-sized dreams. I thought a great way to start off today would have been to uh, just get a bunch of fortune cookies and open them up and read the cheesy dream lines that you find in fortune cookies. Um, you can dream big, shoot for the stars. Uh, that'd be fun, but if you want any content like fortune cookie things on dreams, just Google it, okay? Because I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about God's word and how we can learn how to have God-sized dreams from his word. That's probably a good idea since we're all at church today, right? All right. Got a few with me. That's good. I was 15 years old, living in the state of Oregon, and I got my learner's permit to drive. Now, my dad was the one who taught me to drive. My dad, he helped me learn how to parallel park. He helped me how to just make sure that I could get in and out of the driveway and the garage without wrecking the side wall of the house. Uh, he spent a lot of time, every opportunity that I got to drive with my dad, he would let me drive. My mom, on the other hand, she just stressed me out, okay? Let's just be real here. My mom, she hardly let me drive, and when she did, she would talk to all the other cars around us and be like, this is my son. He has his learner's permit. She, I don't know if your mom had this, but my mom had a, like, a fake brake on her side of the car, and she would pump it a lot, like way before that I ever needed to pump my own brake. And she would white-knuckle the center console as I'd be like taking curves, and she was just stressing me out. I mean, I'd be like, Mom, we haven't even left the driveway yet. Come on. And uh, here's the deal. 23 years ago today, 1991, July 6th, my dad took me to a car dealership off of Powell Boulevard in Portland, Oregon, and I purchased my first car. My parents and I had a deal that I would earn half of my first car, they would kick in the other half. So I got a job and, and had enough money to get a car. We went to the dealership, it was a few days before my 16th birthday, and we picked out a car. A few weeks later, I was able to get my license, first try, I might say. My dad taught me well. Thank you very much. And uh, so I had a car, I had a license, and I had a newfound freedom. Shortly after I got my license and car, we were invited to someone's house in the church that lived probably about 10 miles from our house. And so I asked my dad, can I drive to their house? He's like, yeah, that's no problem. So my mom and dad and two sisters got in their car and drove, and I got in my car and drove over, made it safely. We're good. On the way home that night, on I-205 in Oregon City, Oregon, I was driving behind my dad in the middle lane, and I decided that I was going to get out of the lane he was in. I changed lanes, and I moved up next to him. Now, I had a 1960s car. It had a bench seat in the front. I was driving like this, and when I passed, friends, when I passed my dad, it wasn't like, 
It was the head nod, the point, and the what's up. And I passed him, and I got in front of my dad, and I made sure that all the way home, he could not pass me. I beat my dad to the driveway, and I remember that day because I remember the conversation that followed that. Here's my dad. He was trying to hold me back. I was 16 years old. The state of Oregon had given me a license. He had helped me learn how to drive, so I should be okay, right? That day I learned a valuable lesson that my name wasn't on the title of the car, but my dad's was. <laughs> that was a little lesson there. But here's the deal. Have you ever been in a place where you feel like you couldn't change lanes? You needed to step out, but you couldn't. Friends, I had big dreams. I was 16 years old. I had a car. I could do things I'd never done before, like go through a drive through It was awesome. Um, I didn't have to have mom drop me off at the mall to meet a girl. I could just pick her up at her house. I mean, these were mind-blowing things for a 16-year-old with a license. Uh, of course, I had responsibilities. I had, now, I had to wash my own car and keep my own car clean. I had to put gas in my car and I had to pay for my own insurance. I was a responsible young adult, let me tell you. But that day, I passed my dad. I had to get from behind him teaching me how to drive and make my own move. We're going to talk about God-sized dreams today. Before I get into everything, I want you to stand with me. I want to pray. I believe as I pray today, there's people that are in this room that they need to have dreams stirred in their life. Maybe there is a dream that has died that needs to be rekindled, and I'm going to pray that way for you today. Dear Heavenly Father, I just pray right now for every one of us in this room, God, if there is a dream inside of us, Lord, bring that to fruition today. Bring that to light. God, for those who may be sitting here today and have a dream that has died or stalled, God, I would pray right now that you would come into this room, that you would ignite, you would encourage, and you would give us uh, the pattern from your word of how to accomplish these dreams that you've placed inside of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Before you're seated, turn to the person next to you and tell them, when you were a kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? I believe that God wants to do incredible things through us. I really believe that. And I believe that for that to happen, we have to wrap our mind around this. God's dream for us is that our future be greater than our past. God's dream for us is that our future be greater than our past. In the Bible, in 1 Kings 17, you don't have to turn there. We're going to 1 Kings 19. We'll get to 17 and or 19 in a few minutes, but in verse 17, we're introduced to a guy named Elijah. Everybody say Elijah. Elijah is one of those guys, when you read about him in the Bible, you see how God used Elijah. We just, you pause and you'll be like, oh yeah, Elijah. I don't know if you've seen this guy's resume or not. I'm just letting you know right now, if you're applying for a job and Elijah's applying for the same job, you might as well keep on looking. This guy's resume from the Bible is amazing. Matter of fact, let me just give you some insight to what his resume looks like. He is a prophet for God. God sends him to people, and when he opens his mouth, the words that are coming out of his mouth have been given to the people that he's speaking to. Pretty awesome right there. This guy was known for his prayer life, Elijah. He prophesied that a drought would come, and a drought came. During this drought, God sent ravens to Elijah and fed him. During this drought, Elijah goes to a house of a widow and takes a jug and fills it with oil, enough oil to keep her and her son, give them plenty of nutrition and to keep them all the way through this drought. When the drought needs to end, God opens the mouth of Elijah and says, the drought is done, the drought is done, rain comes. Elijah calls fire down from heaven to consume an altar. Elijah calls fire down from heaven to consume 100 soldiers and their captains. 
when he called fire down to consume an altar, everybody that was there that was watching, not only did he call fire down to his altar, but he called fire down from heaven to the altar of Baal, where these prophets of Baal had been worshiping Baal. God sends fire down through Elijah, through both of them, both of those altars are consumed, and everyone that is watching turns to God. Even the prophets of Baal here. Uh, it's an amazing thing what he does. God basically uses him in a miraculous way. Here's the deal. Elijah is taken from this earth when the heavens open up and a chariot of horses come down, a chariot of horses on fire, come down and pick him up and take him away and he is off the earth like that. This is Elijah's resume. So when you see Elijah in the Bible, you read about the amazing things Elijah does, you stop and you pause and you say, oh yeah, Elijah. Interesting thing. You look at his life and you're like, wow, that's incredible what Elijah did, what God did through Elijah. But do you know that right after he had called fire down from heaven and consumed an altar to God and gave worship to God, Queen Jezebel heard about this. She was uh, kind of upset that people died in this process and that people were consumed by the fire that Elijah called down. She gets mad at him. She sends an army after him, and Elijah gets scared. Like, one day it's like, I call fire down from heaven. Bam! The next day he's like, I'm running away, I'm running away. Right? See, I think Elijah's life's a lot like us. There's days when God is doing amazing things, we recognize his presence, we recognize his power, and everything is going great. And then there's days when we get scared. We're like, where's God? Why is this happening to me? Where's God? He was just there the day before, but we take off and we run. Elijah ends up running to the mountains. He goes up into the mountains and he hides. I think we live our life like Elijah. There's, there's these moments of greatness and we recognize it. And then we recognize the power of God. And there's moments when we just, where'd he go? Here's the deal. I believe that you will never discover the future dreams that God has for you while you're staring at your past. I believe you will never discover your future, future dreams that God has for you while you're looking at your past. Because what happens is we live in a world of consumption. We live in a world where we like to consume things. And what happens is we sometimes lose focus of what God wants to do because we're worried about what we need to do. And what's happened is we get, we get caught up. Uh, using the illustration of driving, when you drove to church today, you'll notice that there is a big windshield in the front of your car. And you look at it because what's in front of you, you need to see the big picture. You'll also notice that there is a tiny little rear view mirror attached to that window. And it just gives you a glimpse of what's going on in the past. You see, the future is very important. And as we're in this series, Future Focus, we need to realize that God has great plans for us. And they're future focused. God's done some incredible things maybe in our lives in the past. Not only in uh, the individual lives that are in this room, but maybe through this church. We know that God's done incredible things. But God's going to continue to do greater things in the future. See, I have found this statement to be true. I've never met someone who is living out God's dreams for their life whose life got smaller. I've never met someone who was living God-sized dreams out in their life. They were teeming with God, their dream, God was a part of their dream, and they were moving out in faith. I've never met someone whose life got smaller because of that. Now, it wasn't necessarily perfect. It maybe wasn't even living at the level that they once were, but their life did not get smaller. You see, God's dream for us is often much bigger than our dreams for ourselves. And as we, as we dive into scripture today, we're going to look at this journey of Elijah and Elisha. See, what happens is Elijah, when he was scared on the mountain, God had to reveal himself to Elijah up on the mountain. God went to Elijah, who's hiding and he meets him on the mountain, and Elijah kind of lays it all out. I'm scared. And he starts talking to God. He's telling him all this. And, and God recognizes something. And God, when God comes, he goes, I'm going to pass by. You come out to the ledge of that mountain. And when, he, when Elijah goes out to the ledge of that mountain, 
God says this, I am here and I am raising someone up behind you because your days are numbered. So Elijah, we see from this point on, Elijah comes down the mountain, he's reminded that God is with him and he goes from literally hiding, from running from the enemy to go find what God has just called him to do and that was to go place the anointing that he had on his predecessor, or on his successor, excuse me. So we find in 1 Kings 19, Elijah. And I want to read just a portion of scripture, 1 Kings 19, just a, a few passages starting in verse 19. So Elijah went and found Elisha. Now I'm going to say Elijah and Elisha a lot today. They're two different people. Elijah went and found Elisha, son of Shaphat, plowing a field. There were 12 teams of oxen in the field, and Elisha was plowing with his 12th team. Elijah went over to him and threw his cloak across his shoulders and then walked away. Elisha left the oxen standing there, ran after Elijah, and said to him, First let me go and kiss my father and mother goodbye, and then I will go with you. Elijah replied, Go on back, but think about what I have done to you. So Elisha returned to his oxen and slaughtered them. He used the wood from the plow to build a fire to roast their flesh. He passed around the meat to the townspeople, and they all ate. Then he went with Elijah as his assistant. You thought your barbecue on 4th of July was pretty awesome. This one was sweet. Let me tell you about it. All right, so we see this passage of Scripture. There's, a, there's some things I want to just point out here. This is Elisha. He is plowing his father's field. Scripture tells us that there are lots of oxen. There's 12 teams of oxen, and he's plowing with one of them. Given that there's lots of land, there's lots of oxen, he's working for his dad. This tells me at this time there is wealth in this family. And what happens here is as he's plowing, Elijah walks up, and he doesn't say a word to him. He literally just puts the cloak on his shoulders. And at that moment, Elisha realizes that what he is doing is not what he's going to be doing. And scripture tells us, as I just read and just alluded to, he goes back, takes the wood from his plow, builds an altar, sacrifices his oxen, and invites all the townspeople to come for a barbecue and celebrate. And I think he does it for two reasons. I think he does it for this, these two reasons. God has something better for him. And he understands that when Elijah places the cloak on his shoulders. And the second thing, he's not coming back. He's not going to come back and keep plowing his father's field because God has something greater for him. God has bigger dreams for Elisha than Elisha probably had for himself. And until that moment that cloak was placed on his shoulders, he probably did not even understand or grasp that. And as we move through scripture today, you're going to see, I don't think Elisha grasped it all the way up to a certain point. He's not coming back. Here's the deal. Becoming aware of God's presence is the first step to realizing his greater purpose for you. Becoming aware of God's presence in your life is the first step to realizing his greater purpose for you. You see, I think we've lost how to dream. Because we get into this day-to-day -day routine, this day-to-day this -day grind, or, or maybe something happens and, and we start to look back and our physical position literally starts to almost cower and, and turn down and even look back because we're trying to deal with the, the urgent, the what's, what's coming now, what's coming next. And what's happened is instead of looking forward, we're starting to look down and around. As a culture, we have lost the ability to dream. Now there's some of us that dream big, and that's awesome. But as a whole, I believe we've lost the ability to dream big. To dream God-sized dreams. So what happens is Elisha, he kisses his mom and dad, has a barbecue, the whole town's invited, they eat. And then scripture tells us Elisha began to walk with Elijah. And this is what Elijah knows. Elijah knows that Elisha, to be the man of God that Elijah is, he's going to have to see some things. So in 2 Kings 2, we see in 15 verses, Elijah take Elisha on a trip. In this trip, there are three cities they visit in one location, a total of four stops. And it's important 
for us in this room to grasp this. If we are going to dream big, if we're going to have God-sized dreams, we need to take the significance of these four locations and apply them to our life today. And that's what I want to do in 2 Kings chapter 2. There's two things that are repetitive in this passage of Scripture. And I'm not going to read the passage of Scripture, but I'm going to tell you what they are. The first is this. There are a group called the Sons of the Prophets. These would be like college theology students that are prophets in training, if you will. And they approach Elisha numerous times on this journey. And they tell him, do you know Elijah's not going to be here very long? And Elisha's response every time is, shh, be quiet about that. Let's not talk about that. Have you ever had to shush somebody? Shh. That's what Elisha does to these, these sons of the prophets who are trying to let him know Elijah's not going to be around very long. Shh. Let's not talk about that. The second thing that you see throughout this passage of scripture is that when Elijah and Elisha are traveling, Elijah gives him every opportunity to stop following him. And tells him, I will go on, you go your way, I'll continue down the road. And every time, Elisha responds with, as long as the Lord shall live, I will follow you. So those are two repetitive things that take place here. What's taking place here is a ton of mentoring. We have a phrase we use around here. We gear to the young and we lean in to the wisdom of the old or wisdom of the wise. And that is what's taking place here. The mentoring relationship is phenomenal here. This is what's going on. They're on this walkabout and spending quality time together. And for God's spirit to be on Elisha, he has to get an understanding from Elijah and they go to four places. And that's where I want to park it today. 2 Kings 2 and verse 1, we see the first of four stops. The first stop is Gilgal. Gilgal. Now here's a significant point here. The Israelites, under the leadership of Moses, they wander in the desert for 40 years. And Moses is the leader. And when they are going into the promised land, it is not Moses who leads them. It is Joshua. Joshua leads the Israelites into the promised land. And when they cross into the promised land, they first stop at Gilgal. Gilgal is where they purify themselves through circumcision. It's right there in 2 Kings 2. Their first stop is Gilgal. We, we read about this uh, earlier on in scripture. They purify themselves from circumcision. Don't ask me why they chose circumcision, but I can tell you that they were directly dealing with flesh and they needed to purify themselves radically. So circumcision was their, their answer. Gilgal, you see, was the place of purification. When you want to live out God's dream for you, there has to be a purifying process. We read about this in scripture in 1 John 1, 9. That we can come and we need to purify ourselves of all unrighteousness. If you want God to use you in an amazing way, we need to be purified of all unrighteousness. Gilgal, the place of purification. 2 Kings 2, the next verse down, we see the next location they go. Scripture doesn't tell us how long they traveled together, but theologians uh, discuss that there was a 6 to 10 year period where Elisha traveled with Elijah. So in this passage of 15 scriptures, it doesn't take place like that. There is some teaching that goes on over a period of time. 2 Kings 2, the next stop is Bethel. We read in Genesis 28. The story of Jacob who is on the run after tricking his dad out of the birthright. And in Genesis 28, Jacob falls asleep at Bethel. And when he is asleep, he has a dream where he is ushered into the presence of God. And he recognizes that. And what takes place from there is that he wakes up. He names that place Bethel, which means God is here. And everyone knew that when they came through that place, God is here. You see, Bethel was the place of realization. You see, we have to understand that if God is going to give us a God-sized dream and we're going to partner with him, that God is here along the journey. Many times there are, are desert times that we go through. 
and Elijah is teaching Elisha that in the desert time that God is there. This is the same Elijah who for a moment had a momentary lapse that God was there and he took off to the mountain. Now he's telling his understudy, guess what? In those desert times, God is there. I know it firsthand because when I was in that spot, God actually passed me by. So you may be in a desert place with a dream. You have to understand if it's a God-given dream and he wants to partner with you and you want him to partner with you, you have to understand this. God is there. Bethel was a place of realization. We need to realize that if God's a part of the dream, God's going to show up on his end of the deal. The third place that we see is Jericho. 2 Kings 2.4, we, we see them stop in Jericho. Now, if you grew up in a church setting or a Sunday school as a kid, you've heard the story of the walls of Jericho. Jericho was this impregnable city that no army could penetrate with their army. It was a city that was walled off and the people were inside that city. And Joshua is sent to Jericho. We read about this in scripture, the significance of Jericho. Joshua is sent to Jericho and he sees the walls. And God instructs Joshua to lead the people around the walls every day for six days. They travel around the walls and nothing happens. On the seventh day, they get to the, the city again, and they walk around it six times, and nothing happens. But on the seventh time, they walk around, and they are praising God, they are worshiping God, and, and they call out to God, and the walls of Jericho come falling down. Jericho, my friends, was a place of confrontation. And if you're dreaming God-sized dreams and you're going to partner with God there, let me just tell you, you are going to have some confrontation. Because there is someone who doesn't want you to do anything for God, and he will do anything to keep you from doing something that God has planned for you. And that is Satan himself. He will tell you. You're a nobody. He will tell you your dream is stupid. He will tell you to keep your mouth shut when God is asking you to open it. There will be confrontation. There will be people around you that might hear you dream and they might even laugh at you. But if God has placed a dream inside of you and you feel that God is going to help you accomplish that dream, let me tell you there's going to be confrontation. This is where it's a place where you can pray up. It's, uh, it's a place where you can link arms with those that are close to you and ask them to walk with you. Because when you're walking with people as you're looking to accomplish a dream, it's much better than walking by yourself. Jericho was a place of confrontation. So we've gone to three cities. The last place that Elijah takes Elisha isn't actually a city, but it is a river. He takes him to the Jordan. Jordan was the place where the Israelites crossed. Matter of fact, Pastor Kevin spoke about it just a few weeks ago. They came to the Jordan River and they needed to cross the river. And as soon as the priest's feet hit the ground, the water separated, they crossed the Jordan. Water was separated. It's only one of a few times in Scripture we see water separate. And the interesting thing here is Elijah took Elisha there and let him know that the Jordan was a place of expectation. You see, I serve a God that is huge. And if God gives me a God-sized dream, I believe that God can help me accomplish that dream. There are times when I pray with people, and I will pray for a miracle. And when I pray to God, just as you pray to God, we pray that God will deliver on what we are asking for. Correct? We believe that God can deliver. We believe that God can heal. We believe that our God is a big enough God to do what we have been asked now, it doesn't mean that we're going to get the answers we want all the time and the timing we want. But we approach God knowing that our God is great and we approach with expectancy. Here's the deal. When Elijah and Elisha got to the Jordan, do you know what happened? Elijah took off his cloak, he slapped the water with it, and the two of them walked across as the waters was parted. And they get to the other side. And when they get to the other side, Elijah turns to Elisha. And Elijah turns to Elisha and he says, ask of anything right now and, and I'll give it to you. Tell me what you want. And Elisha turns to Elijah and goes, I want double what you got. 
I want double the anointing that you have. Hello, people. Did you read the resume that I just, did you hear it? The, the things that Elijah did, Elisha is now asking for two times that. Friends, this isn't like going to lunch and when someone offers to pick up the tab and you realize that, you're like, well, in that case, we'll take dessert. You know, it's not like that moment right there. Not like supersize it for me. No. Do you understand what Elisha is asking? He is asking for two times the anointing that Elijah has on him. Two times, friends. Talk about dreaming big. It's kind of like dream on, man. <laughs> this is Elijah, one of the greatest prophets that we read about of God's people in history. And Elisha's over here going, I'll take two of that. Crazy. But Elijah's response to Elisha for even asking that is awesome. He's like, well, if you're traveling with me and you see me leave this earth, then I'll let you have that anointing. But if I'm taken from this earth and you don't see me when I'm taken, I'm sorry. Not going to happen. That was a paraphrase, but that was a pretty close paraphrase. I'm sure there's a few buddies and bros in that conversation as well. Because I think, you know, we don't read all of that in scripture. But buddy, if that's what you want, I know that's how we talk. Buddy, if that's what you want and you see me leave this earth, then man, you're going to get that, bro. That's kind of how it really went, I think. So here's the deal. You know it's a God-sized dream when only God can help you accomplish it. And you have to stop and say, for this dream to be accomplished, I need to partner with God. And if God makes this dream come true, unbelievable. That's how you know it's a God-sized dream. Because you're not going to be able to do it by yourself. God is going to have to partner with you and help you accomplish that dream. And Elijah tells Elisha, hey, this is, what's, this is what needs to take place here. Here's the deal. The very next passage of scripture, after Elijah goes, well, if you see me taken from this earth, then, yep, you're going to get it, bro. The very next passage of scripture, the heavens open up. The two prophets are separated a chariot of fire and horses comes down in a whirlwind, picks Elijah up and takes him away. Now think with me for a second. There is a half a second there where Elisha's like, you know his eyes are like popping out of his head like, what just happened? And it's for like a half a second because remember what he just asked, that double blessing, and, and if he sees Elisha taken from him? Then there's that moment of, Yes! Two times, two times, you know it. I mean, they don't use like exclamation points all the time in here in scripture and stuff, but Elisha understands what just happened. Here's the deal. When that does happen, Elijah's gone. And as you read through this passage of scripture, the only thing left is a cloak on the ground. And Elisha, for that Half a second, what just happened? The next half a second, yes! Immediately, he leans down and he picks up the cloak. He picks up the cloak. And this is significant. Do you remember when Elisha was found plowing his father's field and Elijah took the cloak and placed it over his shoulders? That cloak now is on the ground and Elisha realizes that it is on him now. Do you know what this cloak represents? This cloak represents the dreams that we have teamed with the presence of God. And when we pick up that cloak with that understanding, friends, incredible things will happen in our lives. God will use us to do amazing things. Do you realize that there are people that are like hiding behind the walls of Jericho in your life right now and they're walled off from you? But when you pick up that cloak, those walls will come down because the presence and power of God is on you and he's called you to dream. Just like the prophet Elijah and the prophet Elisha, there are people that are intersected in your life and God has called you to speak into their life when they are crossing your path. And with this cloak on, it represents the presence and power of God that is going to be on you. But the thing is, we just can't leave it on the ground. We have to pick up the cloak. Take up the cloak. And when 
Elisha does this. He picks up the cloak. There is a greater confidence on him and authority placed on him more than he will ever know. But he recognizes it. They had just crossed the Jordan River, which means that now Elijah's gone. Elisha's on the other side all by himself. He picks up the cloak, and his problem or dilemma now is, I need to get back to the other side. He picks up the cloak. He walks to the feet of the Jordan River. He takes the cloak. He takes it off the shoulders. And do you know what he does? He does what his mentor did. He takes the cloak, and he, before he slaps it, do you know what he does? He calls out to God. He says, where is God, the God of Elijah? There is confidence on him now. He takes it off and he slaps the water. And when he slaps the water, do you know what happens? The water separates just like it did for Elijah. And when he walks across, the sons of the prophets are on the shore and they see Elisha walking through the split water and they recognize immediately that this is the man that God has chosen for this time, and he has the same power on him and anointing on him that Elijah had. And they actually come to Elisha and they bow down to him because they understand that the presence of God is upon him. And in scripture, this is kind of a funny thing. Scripture says they want to know where like Elijah went. Like, where's Elijah? And they actually want to go looking for him. They send 50 sons of the prophets out looking for Elijah. And Elisha's like, Go for it. You're not going to find him, but go for it. And they go out looking for him. But they know at this time that the power and presence of God represent that was represented on Elijah is now on Elisha. You see, friends, God's plan for us combined with our dreams equal extraordinary events in our ordinary lives. That's a powerful statement right there. I want you to catch it again. God's plan for us combined with our dreams equals extraordinary events in our ordinary lives. Friends, the thing is, we need to pick up the cloak. We need to strike the water. Whatever that dream is, some of you are in here today, and that represents a dream that's on the ground. It's stalled. Maybe it's a dead dream to you. But today that dream has been stirred up. Maybe there's a dream that God has placed on you. Maybe you don't have a dream right now and this week you're going to start dreaming again. Friends, pick up that cloak. The presence of God combined with the dream that God has given you, man, that is an unstoppable force. I said it earlier and I'll say it again, becoming aware of God's presence is the first step and realizing his dreams and plans for us. We have to become aware of his presence. Friends, pick up that cloak. Some of you will wanna know, how do you know if it's a God-sized dream? How do I know that God is talking to me? This is what I tell people. Let God orchestrate your life within the context of his word. What I mean by that is if you're looking for God to team with him for a dream that you have, go to scripture and let scripture reveal to you what God is speaking to you. That's one way that you know that you're living a God-sized dream. There may be people in this room and you don't even know or have a relationship with who Jesus is. And you may be thinking, how can I do great things for God? I don't even know who this guy is. Let me tell you, I have a friend who was drunk He was driving down the road in a truck, running away from his wife. And God met him in his truck, said, you need to pull your life together. You need to turn that truck around. You need to go back to your wife. And the presence of God met him there, a guy who did not even know who God was. God met him in his truck. He turned around. He went back to his wife. And guess what he's doing today? He's preaching a message to people because now he is a pastor. So don't tell me or don't don't sit back and think, well, God can't use anybody like me. He won't reveal dreams to me. You know what? God will do what he wants to do because we come with an expectant heart. And when we come with that expectant heart, we can know that we believe a God that will team with us for amazing things to happen. There are 70,000 people in this valley that do not know who Jesus is. They don't participate in church. They don't claim to have faith. And it is our role to step up, pick up the cloak, 
have those conversations with those people who may be walled off from who even God is right now. I close with this story. Uh, the 4th of July I celebrated with my family in Portland, Oregon. We drove over yesterday. And uh, on July 4th, uh, we had all of uh, two sisters and family were there. And uh, toward the end of the day, everybody just kind of, you know, went on their way. There was uh, my family of five, my mom and dad, my one sister who's a couple years younger than I, my aunt, and my nana. The ages in the room spanned six years old to 95. And we're sitting around the room and we're just talking. And my sister, and it'd be easy to think I started this, but my, because I'm preaching on it today, my sister said, hey, let's talk about what our goals are for the summer. So we went around and we talked about what our goals were. And that led to the next question is, what are the dreams that God has for you? And you know the awesome part is, is everybody from my little six-year-old to my 95-year-old Nana were sharing dreams that God had placed on them. So let me tell you this, if you have a pulse, you have a purpose. It doesn't, don't let age draw you back. Don't say I'm too young or don't say I'm too old. God will give you dreams. Make sure that the dreams that you have are aligned with what God's dreams are for you. That's key. And do that through the context of his word. Friends, I believe that God is stirring dreams in the life of this church that are dreams that are amazing. Some of them may seem unattainable. This is what I love about Pastor Kevin. Pastor Kevin is a dreamer. And uh, as a staff, we were talking about some of the dreams. Uh, he found a book that he had written out some dreams for this church that he wrote right before he got here about two years ago. And he was already seeing some of the, the dreams that he had dreamt for this church start to happen. People, God is going to establish dreams in our lives and we're gonna see them happen. For some of us, God's gonna establish dreams. We may not see them happen, but the generation behind us will. And we gotta believe that way, friends. I wanna pray for you today. In just a moment, I'm going to uh, pray. And after I pray, the host team is going to come down and receive our tithes and offerings. But before they do, and before I pray, I want to bring you to this card. On the back of this card, there are four boxes that we want you to think about checking today. The first is, I will give my life to Jesus. If you're here, you don't have a relationship, we want to walk with you. We want to come alongside of you, and we want to help you in that relationship with Jesus. If that's you today, we want you to check that box. The next box is, I will discover or rediscover my dreams by being future focused. It's worded rediscover or discover because some of you need to rediscover your dreams. For others, you just need to dream. The next one is, I need to live a greater life for God by dreaming bigger. It's easy to throw dreams out there that may not be that big and it's great to accomplish them. But man, dream big because we serve a big God. And finally, I want God's plan combined with my dreams to equal extraordinary events in my life. There's four boxes that you can check there. You can check more than one if you want to. But our staff goes through this and we want to give you the tools. We want to know how to prepare and help and walk alongside of you in accomplishing those dreams that God has for us as a church. Let me pray for you and our usher team will come and I'll wrap up after they're done. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the people of this church, this valley. God, I pray right now, Lord, a blessing on the dreams that we have in this room. God, I would pray, Lord, that you would help us journey to those same places where we can see expectancy, like at the Jordan, where, where we're going to hit confrontation from the enemy, like Jericho, that we're going to realize that you're there, like at Bethel, or that we need to purify ourselves like they did at Gilgal. God, whatever stage in our dream we are at right now, God, we ask that you meet us there. God, we believe you're gonna do amazing things through us and through this church. And God, that is our hope today. God, we thank you for the faithfulness of the people of this church and their giving, their tithes and offerings. God, continue to bless us as we move forward in Jesus' mighty name, amen. Ushers come.
friends, if you'll stand with me. Next week, we continue in our series, What's Next, Future Focus. Pastor Kevin's going to talk about how to recover when a dream's failed. Or when a failure happens in your life, how do you bounce back from that? That's going to be next week. Friends, remember when you walk out these doors, you don't go by yourself, but God goes before us. God is with us. Who can be against us? Remember, you have dreams. you got to pick up the cloak. So take up that cloak. Wrap it around tight and know that when you walk out these doors, you walk out with the presence of God upon you no matter where you go. And that's my prayer for you today. Blessings to you guys. Have a great week.